Good morning, everyone. Welcome. And thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Susanna Kohler. I'm the press officer for the AAS, and I am happy to welcome you all here to the first press conference of AAS 242, the 242nd meeting of the American Astronomical Society. We are in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and today is Monday. It is 1015 roughly a.m., and we are starting the press conference Discoveries in Distant Galaxies. So I've got here with me today my co-hosts. So Carrie Hensley is the deputy press officer, and Ben Cassis is the AAS media fellow. So they will be helping with the online portion of this and the Q&A section. Um, and then I've also got in the room Sumit Kulkarni, who is the Astrobytes media intern for the meeting. Uh, so we've got a great lineup this morning. We've got some press releases that will be coming out in association with this, and I will add all of those links to the press releases and to the speakers' materials into the press kit online. You can find that via the meeting website. So those will all be added later today. Also, the video, this is being recorded. So uh, this is uh, going to be accessible online later today. I'll also have the video uploaded and it's archived. Uh, so the way we're going to do this is I will go through and give a brief introduction to the topic and our panelists. Then all of the panelists will go through and speak in order back to back. So please hold your questions through that. And then at the end, we will go into a Q&A session where you can ask them everything you've been holding on to. <laughs> um, and we'll see how, how many questions we can get through. We've also got folks joining us online. Thanks so much for being there. So for those of you who are there, you can pack, you know, type your questions into the Q&A section on Zoom, and uh, we'll be holding on to those and reading those out during the Q&A session later. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, we are not actively monitoring the question session there. Unfortunately, we won't be able to answer those. <laughs> All right. I think that's it for the preliminaries. Oh, and if you're in, please, if you're in the room, please silence your devices. Thank you. <laughs> So as I mentioned, this session is titled Discoveries in Distant Galaxies. So this is a great session uh, in which we will be discussing both things that have recently been discovered with uh, some great new telescopes or old telescopes in some cases, uh, but also kind of the potential capabilities of what's coming ahead. So uh, today we're gonna to start with a virtual presenter or Gottlieb in Northwest, at Northwestern University is going to be presenting on jetted and turbulent stellar deaths, new LIGO detectable sources of gravitational waves. Then we'll move into the room with an introduction to the JWST JADES project given by Marsha Riki from University of Arizona. Uh, then Kevin Hainlein is going to, from Stewart Observatory, is going to talk about the cosmos in its infancy. JWST JADES reveals hundreds of galaxies at Z greater than eight. Then we'll move to Ryan Ensley from the University of Texas at Austin, who's going to present on uncovering the properties of dwarf galaxies in the early universe with JWST. Then Jane Rigby from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center will present on JWST smoking out organic molecules in the early universe. And lastly, Patrick Kamineski from Arizona State University will tell us about illuminating star formation in the warped dusty galaxy El Anzuelo with JWST. So if you're here for JWST stuff, you're in the right place. <laughs> All right, and with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Marsha to introduce, and then uh, bear with me because we'll have to do a little, oh, sorry, no, my apologies to Orr, who's going to present virtually. So I'm going to do a little shuffling here to make sure that you can all see his slides. Let's see. Okay, so if you go ahead and share your screen. Oh. Okay. Um, Give me one moment or sorry. Uh, let me just make sure that the folks in the room can see your slides as well. Mm 
Okay. This is not super elegant, but it's going to work. <laughs> All right, is that okay? Can everybody see what's going on? Wonderful, okay, take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to show you a new prediction of a new gravitational wave source that can potentially be detected in the near future um, by LIGO Virgo Kagura collaboration observing runs. Um, so gravitational waves are typically uh, divided into two types of gravitational waves, first of which is inspired gravitational waves. Uh, these are all the gravitational waves detected so far uh, by LIGO Virgo Kagura. So they come from compact object mergers. It can be black holes and then neutron star mergers. In this case, we have the coalescence of compact objects, which emit uh, coherently gravitational waves. And you can think about it as uh, an orchestra that is playing harmonically the gravitational waves that we can later detect here on Earth. Um, the other type of gravitational waves is stochastic gravitational waves, which unlike these inspired gravitational waves is incoherent. And this comes from stellar explosions or other types of incoherent sources. So perhaps the first place to look for these stochastic gravitational waves are the most energetic explosions in the universe known as supernovae. And in this case, what we have is different regions in the explosion that emit gravitational waves at different frequency. As a result, we have a, an incoherent signal that makes it much harder to detect compared to inspiral gravitational waves. Nevertheless, there is lots of anticipation towards the first detection of stochastic gravitational waves or the first detection of gravitational waves not from a compact object merger. And this is something that is expected to be detected in uh, the coming decade or so. So as I mentioned, supernovae are, have been considered for many years to be one of the most promising production sites of these stochastic gravitational waves. And moreover, if we look at the most energetic supernovae, which would be even more promising in this sense, then what we actually go for is collapsars. And collapsars are supernovae that are accompanied by relativistic jets. So the story is that there is a massive star reaching the end of its life. It's collapsing to a black hole. And from the black hole, there is a relativistic jet that is launched. This is the most powerful explosion in the universe. And this, this uh, jet can also produce gravitational waves. So when we consider these systems, there are actually two components that can help us with gravitational waves. The first of which is the supernova explosion itself. Um, the problem with supernovae is that they're too weak to be detected due to their rather spherical nature. So in order to generate strong gravitational wave signal, we need large deviation from a spherical mass distribution. This is something that we cannot achieve in a supernova explosion, which is rather spherical. And therefore, the detection of supernovae is limited uh, to our own galaxy. And therefore, we may need to wait for dozens of years before we detect the first signal of gravitational waves from, from these uh, uh, events. In jets, uh, thanks to the high asphericity of the jet, we can generate strong gravitational waves. But the problem is that these jets evolve over very long time scales of a few dozens of seconds, which correspond to very low frequencies, frequencies that are outside of the uh, frequency band that LIGO is, is sensitive to. And therefore, we do not expect to detect jets either uh, in LIGO. So what we did is that we ran, uh, we simulated for the first time the explosion all the way from the black hole to outside of the star, the full explosion. And uh, what we, we saw is the formation of these jets from the black hole. And as they drilled their way through the star, uh, what you can see here is that they generate this yellow bubble around them. And this is something that you can think of as a drill bit th uh, drilling through the wall. And there is debris from the shocked a stellar material that is spilled sideways to form this extended structure of the jet, which is highly energetic. And this is something known as a cocoon. So the cocoon co-evolving with the jet can also emit uh, electromagnetic emission just like the jet. And this is a source, potential source of gravitational waves that has never been investigated um, before uh, this time. So we wanted to look into the gravitational waves from the cocoon. And the reason why this can be a, an interesting gravitational wave source is that it has a right shape that is uh, largely aspherical. 
Um, it has the right frequency because it evolves over much shorter time scales than the jet and therefore it emits gravitational waves in higher frequencies. It has energy that at least as much as the energy of the jet. And as I mentioned, it's also an electromagnetic emission source. And therefore, it is if it emits gravitational waves, it's a multi-messenger source. So we calculated the gravitational waves from this uh, cocoon. And what I'm going to show you is a movie that shows the gravitational wave density and the sonification. Is the gravitational wave. And you can see the cocoon that is engulfing the jet that emits gravitational waves on top of the gravitational waves that are coming from the jet. So the jet is here in red and the cocoon is in yellow green. So um, when you actually look at the signal that you get is what we see is that the emission from the cocoon is the strongest when it's observed off axis thanks to the um, aspherical projected shape of the cocoon on the sky. And uh, it turns out to be two orders of magnitude brighter than supernova uh, gravitational waves. It peaks at about 100 hertz, which is something that is uh, perfect for detection by LIGO Virgo Kagra observing runs. So to summarize, uh, the cocoons are the most promising stochastic gravitational wave sources in LVK known to date. Um, and they're also promising multi-messenger sources, which means that we can actually use the electromagnetic emission from cocoons or from supernovae to have a targeted gravitational wave search and maximize our chances of having the first uh, stochastic gravitational wave detection. I will just mention that this is the first time that this cocoon has uh, been suggested as the gravitational wave source and many more analytic and numerical models are required in order to understand better the physics that we can extract from future detections of gravitational waves from cocoons. Thank you for your attention. I will end here. Thank you so much. All right. So we should be able to go ahead here. And Carrie and Ben, what do you see on the Zoom at this point? Perfect. Okay. So, Marcia, if you want to go ahead and. Thank you. Yes, good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here to announce the first data release from JADES, the JWST Advanced Deep Extragalactic Survey. We're having a special session tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. where you can learn more. And it's my um, great pleasure to introduce two of the speakers from the special session tomorrow, both Kevin Hainlein and Ryan Ensley. And as I mentioned, the reason that we're having this special session is that th this program is the result of two GTO teams, one from NIRCAM and one from NIRSPEC, joining forces to do the deepest observations of distant galaxies in the first year of JWST's operation. And we're releasing the data early and we're releasing not just the raw data, but when you see the references to websites and things, you'll be able to find mosaics, catalogs, photometric redshifts. So I will turn it over to um, the other two speakers that will be talking about our great JWST results. Thank you. All right, I believe 
we are now good. Should be able to do this. Great. Everyone can see that on the screens here and online. Exciting. Hi, everyone. I'm Kevin Hainline. I'm a research professor at the University of Arizona uh, and a member of the Jade's NearCam team. Uh, and I'm really excited to present uh, some very, very uh, new off the presses results that should appear on the archive this afternoon that uh, uh, showcase the power of the Jade's survey. Um, this is a, a work of many, many people on both the Jade's NearCam team and the Jade's NearSpec team. And uh, we're very, very happy to present this today. Um, I'm going to be talking about the first 600 million years of the universe, which is an amazing thing that we can talk about that at all, thanks to JWST. Um, this is important because galaxies have historically been pretty tough to see once you get to a high enough redshift, generally due to the fact that while Hubble is a, is a fantastic telescope with great instruments, the wavelength range on Hubble was limited such that you couldn't see galaxies above a certain redshift of around 10-ish. With the launch of JWST, we've entered the most exciting era of extragalactic science where we're starting to see these early galaxies in the early universe. The Jade survey, as Marcia just brought up, is the most comprehensive JWST extragalactic survey thus far in terms of its wavelength coverage, the field that it observes, the number of filters that it uses, and its observational depth. That's okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's the W, right? Yeah. Is it good? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to move this a little far so it's not in my way a little bit. There we go. Yeah, perfect. Okay. And we're also pretty excited because early results from Jade's included the discovery. Up, 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 up. We're back. We're back. Early results from Jade's included the discovery and spectroscopic confirmation of what is now known when it is the farthest galaxy humans have ever seen, a galaxy called Jade's GSZ-13. Um, just to give you some uh, like a, a refresher on how we find these galaxies, we find them by virtue of the fact that galaxies are surrounded by a cocoon and, you know, inside of the galaxies as well, neutral hydrogen, which acts like a filter. Ultraviolet light is blocked by this filter so that it can't escape. If you took a picture of a galaxy in this ultraviolet light, you wouldn't see it. Take a picture of a longer wavelength and suddenly you would. That then gets redshifted to longer and longer wavelength bands. So here are three Jade's galaxies. One of them we call an FO90 drop, one is an F115 drop, and one's an F150 drop. And that's because, as you can see from the red bar, you don't see it at the wavelength shorter than the red bar, but you do see it at the longer wavelengths. Jade's is exceptional because of how many filters we have detecting these galaxies longer than the red bar. It's pretty incredible. Um, we are announcing 717 galaxies in the Jade's full Jade survey above a redshift of eight. Uh, this is the first 600 million years after the Big Bang. To put this into context, this is 717 objects from like this incredibly short amount of time. If you took the whole universe and shrunk it down so it was a two hour movie, you're seeing the first five minutes of the movie. This is important because we live in a universe that, of complexity and the early universe was hydrogen, helium, and light. These are the galaxies that are starting the process of making the elements and the complexity that we see in the world around us today. This is also an important field that we're looking at because it is the field that contains two very famous observations, the Hubble Deep Field in the Goods North on the, on the right panel here and the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. But you can see those are small boxes nestled in this enormous Jade's footprint. Jade's goes deeper, it goes wider with many more filters than Hubble. This is something where for, for years since JWST started, you know, like, planning observations, I would hear people say, when is it going to look at the Hubble Ultra Deep Field? This is the data looking at the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. These are the high redshift galaxies in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Over 93% of the sources in this study have never been seen before. These, uh, up until before JWST, we'd known maybe two high redshift or galaxies above redshift 10 in this field. You can see them here, but it wasn't and in the first year, you know, like the first couple months of JWST, we expanded that out somewhat. These are the objects in this paper. This is the rest of the iceberg. And what's amazing about this is that you can see, because on the y-axis, there's bright objects to much fainter objects, that what we were seeing before were just the brightest, most extreme examples of bright galaxies in the early universe. And now we're really probing down to what are more normal 
you know, everyday styles of galaxies in a turbulent young universe. It's very, very exciting to see all of these objects together. I'm so, I've been waiting so long to show everyone and it's it's really, really thrilling to, to show this. Most of our galaxies, you know, are like the galaxies we talked about last year, small hundred parsec or so uh, nuggets in, you know, like of, of star formation, but we're really excited also that some of them aren't. These galaxies here are galaxies that are not just little nuggets, they have structure. They're multiple galaxy components extended over kiloparsec distances. You can see, you know, some of these objects, uh, we're, we're plotting them in, in, in two different filters. So you can see how the stars are and then the underlying, you know, galaxy background uh, that, that surrounds the stars. My favorite is in the bottom, is in the right. Uh, it's a galaxy that is seen, you know, 400 million years after the Big Bang, and it's already two clump components spread out over, you know, a kiloparsec. This is an amazing, amazing data set. And we're so excited to be able to present this because these are incredible objects for follow-up observation. On top of that, we're very confident in our photometric redshifts. We have 42 objects with spectroscopic confirmations above redshift eight. And these 42 objects have a pretty good, like they, they show that our photometric redshifts are, are exceptional. We're doing a fantastic job of predicting where these objects are with the JADES data and, and, uh, and, and getting confirmed. So across the 225 square arc minutes of the Jade's footprint, we're announcing 717 of the earliest galaxies. Uh, these are from the first 600 million years after the Big Bang. 93% are unique, are, are new to this study, and many of them have complex structure across many kiloparsecs, demonstrating the ways in which galaxies were being built in the early universe. And we find excellent validation with our methods of identifying these high redshift galaxies. Thank you so much. Okay, are we seeing it on the Zoom? You can't look away. More high tools. Thank you. Wonderful. Oh, finally. Wonderful. All right, so um, yeah, I'm following uh, up on Kevin's results. So my name is Ryan Inslee. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Austin at Texas. Um, so what we just heard about Kevin was, as he explained, about the first five minutes of a two hour movie describing our universe. What I'll be talking about is basically the next scene in that movie, the first five to eight minutes of the movie of the universe, if you will. And the reason why we care about this next scene is because it allows us to study galaxies in much greater detail, as I'll explain here very shortly. So first, okay. Um, so first of all, I just want to explain why this next scene in the history of the universe is so important. So this is whenever what we know as cosmic reionization occurred. So cosmic reionization is basically whenever all of the hydrogen atoms that were scattered throughout the very early universe were broken apart into protons and electrons. They were ionized. And they were ionized by the first light that was created by early galaxies. So in this next scene of the universe, we are starting to actually see the impact of galaxy formation on the composition of the large scale universe. 
This is actually whenever galaxies are influencing the entire universe as a whole. So how do we study these early galaxies? Well, one of the main ways that we want to do this is with emission lines. So galaxy emission lines are very valuable probes of both the ionizing light that is coming out of them, as well as recent star formation. So basically these emission lines are formed by ultraviolet light coming off of very hot, massive stars that have recently formed within galaxies. And that light interacts with the gas within the galaxies as well. And that ionizes some of the atoms in there, hydrogen, oxygen, and whenever those atoms, you know, uh, cool down over time and they recombine, you get these emission lines at very discrete wavelengths, just given quantum mechanics, basically. So what you get are these very strong features that you can readily see in spectra. And there's some of them are just shown here. But what's really important here is that you don't always need spectra to study these emission lines. You can also use imaging. If you have these very tiny filters where you're just gathering small little intervals of light across a given wavelength regime, then you can very readily see the impact of these very strong emission features as shown in this example of a nearby star forming region here down on the lower right. So these are uh, this is an image taken with Hubble. And what you're seeing in blue light is ionized oxygen in the star forming region. And what you're seeing in uh, green light is the ionized hydrogen that is cooling down as well. So we basically are applying this kind of same idea with the near cam imaging that we have from JADES to study the emission line features among hundreds of galaxies within the early JADES survey to study how the first galaxies assembled, formed their stars, and ultimately drove the process of cosmic reionization. So as Kevin motivated before, JADES is going far deeper, covering far more area than we previously were able to do with Hubble. And not only that, but we're able to extend to redder wavelengths. And by extending to those redder wavelengths, we are capturing the signatures of these emission line features from very early galaxies. So we're going past the tip of the iceberg, if you will, um, that really we were only able to study in challenge. It was a very much a challenge to study them, uh, the brightest objects prior to JBC. But now it's relatively easy to study them with James Webb, but not only just the brightest objects, but also the far more abundant numerous population that existed in the early universe. And I'm just showing this kind of pyramid style collage of the colors that we're seeing in these very early galaxies from the emission lines that they are emitting. Okay. So this is just one example of a galaxy that we're finding in the very early universe. And it is a system with extreme emission lines. And these extreme emission lines are actually relatively common in the very early universe. That is one of the main conclusions of what we're finding in this study. So about 10 to 20% of these very early galaxies, about one in six, show these extreme line emission features that are only seen in an exceedingly rare subset of galaxies at present day. I'm talking far less than 1%, okay? What is that telling us about these early galaxies? Well, what it seems to be implying is that they formed their stars in bursts. So stars were not basically smoothly building up at like one sun per year or something like that. All of a sudden you would have tens of suns worth of solar masses being assembled all at once basically in these early galaxies. And this kind of gives you these starburst regions like we know exist locally, again, very rare, but we do know that some of them exist locally as can be seen here in the lower right. And what you get out of that is just torrents of these, uh, of these ultraviolet photons that are being produced by these very blue hot massive stars as you can see in this image. And that's really important for our understanding of how reionization happened because these hot massive stars were very efficient producers of these ultraviolet photons that we needed in order to ionize all the hydrogen in the early universe, okay? So these hot massive stars produce those ultraviolet photons. Those photons go out, leak out into the intergalactic medium, permeating the entire universe, and that interacts with the hydrogen gas, basically splitting them apart into protons and electrons, and that creates the ionized universe that we still see today, but it happened within the first billion years of cosmic history. Another key result that we're finding out of this early study is that the nature of the brightest very early galaxies is considerably different than that of the faintest galaxies. So the brightest galaxies that we're finding tend to be composed of objects that have recently undergone a huge burst of star formation as shown here in the top right. And again, those are pretty much the only systems that we were able, even able to study prior to James Webb, and even that was a huge challenge. 
Now we're going far past the tip of the iceberg and we're seeing and being able to study in detail these much fainter objects representative of far more numerous galaxies that existed early on in the universe. And what we're finding is that those objects are more evenly comprised of these bursting systems, but also objects that have relatively inactive star formation, as you would expect if these things underwent bursts and then shut off for a little bit, basically, and then rose up again and went off. This kind of idea of how star formation worked very early on in the universe is considerably different than how star formation works at present day. And this is giving us vital clues into, you know, probably the existence of these unexpected, very bright galaxies that we found in very early cosmic epochs that you probably heard over the past year. And with that, I'll end um, my talk with this quick summary. So we're finding an astonishingly high rate of extreme emission line galaxies at Russia 6 to 9. These very early galaxies assembled in bursts of star formation. The hot massive stars formed during those bursts drove cosmic reionization. And they were getting clues that the earliest bright galaxies that were identified with James Webb over the past year are probably undergoing these bursts of star formation. Thank you very much. Different presenter view, or can I just close it? Doesn't. Okay. <laughs> what you don't see it on the Zoom? That's Jim. You see it on the Zoom? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I will. Does anybody know how in Keynote to do it? And enable presenter this graphic time at all. Thank you. So we can Yeah, you do that. Like you think less than one second. I'm not sure. Uh, so I need it to show on the screen as well. Oh, to for it to go out. For it to go in the room. Okay. If anybody has keynote experience. Right. Yeah, that's where it was. And then share. Oh, okay. so I am I think I got it. I go out and probably they haven't set up the keynote references uh when it's play. Um really. It's play. I was looking to see whether it's play in the window or play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so play center display mm -hmm. is off. So why is that? Oh, that's <laughs> not true. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other way to do it is to tell it to play in a window. But I don't know why that is. Is that true? Uh -huh. um, can, you, can you get the tech support folks? Uh, they are tech support for the audio, but not for. The video? Okay, but um, not do we have uh, why don't we export it to a PDF? <laughs> uh file. Export to a PDF. That's just fine. Um is that a good place? Wherever you want to get you want to wherever you want to I find have it. No idea where I'm gonna find it again. Desktop is good. And then we'll grab that off the desktop. Did you have movies though? Hmm? 
I'm going to turn it off, actually. Yeah. We just turned it off. It's just going to So then go to the desktop. Oh, well. So X out of here. Sorry. Can I drag from it? Please, please. Okay. Um, that, where's the desktop? Yeah, exactly. That's the problem. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Did you have movies or no? No, I don't okay, have movies. All right. That makes it easy. Yeah. Yeah, apparently. We got there. All right. Thank you for your patience. Okay. Exit it. Stop share. Oh, resume share. No, it didn't work. Sorry. Um, Adobe Reader, share. Okay. And hide controls. Okay, we vanquished, does that work? We vanquished Zoom. All right, um, thank you for folks who are here this morning. Good morning, hello local daytime to folks joining us online. My name is Jane Rigby um, and uh, my contact information is up here. Um, I wear a couple different hats. The hat I'm wearing today is principal investigator of the templates program. Um, I'm here pinch hitting for the lead authors of the papers that I'm going to talk about. So I have highlighted those quotes. The early career people that you should quote, I hope, uh, are Justin Spilker and Kadar Fadke, and I will highlight their contributions as we go. Okay, I'm here as the, the pinch hitter. Um, all right, so uh, there we go. Okay, so the, the result that I'm going to talk about today is JBST, a JBST discovery smoking out organic molecules in the early universe. And the context to understand this discovery is that uh, these are, we're presenting at this meeting new results from the program Templates. Templates is one of 13 of JBST's early release science programs that were designed to get results early in the mission and to get good data uh, in the hands of the community as soon as possible. In templates, we have only four galaxies, so much smaller samples than, than we've heard about. Um, so these are targeted studies of galaxies that have been gravitationally lensed. So each of these galaxies has had that rare thing happen to it, where from our perspective, we see the light having gone through a cosmic telescope, either a galaxy cluster or a galaxy that acts like a natural telescope, um, a gravitational lens. And so that, uh, that gravitational lensing provides a boost of uh, the galaxies appear much brighter, and they also appear magnified compared to what they are really. So JBST sees these, uh, the, these templates galaxies in ways that we just haven't been able to do before. And I want to point out that two of the four galaxies in our sample are utterly invisible to Hubble. We've looked at them with Hubble, you don't see anything. So with JBST, we're seeing through the dust to see the stars and the gas um, and the dust itself inside these galaxies. Okay, so let me get straight to the result. These are the family picture of our, uh, our, our sample. Um, so the, the result I'm going to talk about today, we have an Einstein ring. Um, and... So that Einstein ring that, you know, it, it, the galaxy looks like an almost complete ring, that's due to the gravitational lensing, right? And so we've got a, a, a background slide on this of just what is that? How does it happen? It's a chance alignment between a foreground galaxy and a galaxy in the background, okay? Um, all right, so so that's it. That's our, that's our uh, result we're talking about today. This ring, um, we see in, in orange here are organic molecules. They're uh, PAWs, aromatic hydrocarbons. They're actually the same molecule that you get in dust, um, in smoke, really, um, uh, as well as it's, it's a carcinogen on Earth. Um, so don't put it up your nose. But when we find it in the distant universe, what it can tell us is about what the dust is doing and how the gas and dust is uh, forming, condensing and forming into stars. Right, so the galaxy in the background we're seeing as it looked three billion, like uh, um, it looked um, uh, when the universe was only three billion years old, um, and so we see both what the gas is doing, what the dust is doing, and what the what the stars are doing, right? And so the result, and this is in a paper by Spilker et al. that that is coming out um, today, 
um, is that we're seeing, and so here this is showing, um, so the, the result is this is the earliest discovery, this is the furthest back in time we've ever been able to see organic molecules in the universe, that we see these dust features. And some context for this is that, uh, the other result is that we're seeing these galaxies with JWST in a way we never have been, we've never been able to before. And so in these four panels here, I'm showing we're seeing in the left panel where the stars are in the Einstein ring, right? Where the, the stars are in the middle panel, that's the that molecule, the pause, uh, the dust, where the dust is. Um, and in the right bottom panel where the gas is, the hydrogen. And then the top is where the, um, looking at where the, the heavier elements are, where the nitrogen and oxygen is compared to the hydrogen. So we're, none of these were things that we could measure for galaxies this far back. Uh, before JBST, and certainly not in a, um, a spatially resolved way. So we're able, again, these galaxies, this galaxy is invisible to Hubble to peer inside of it and see where the dust is, where the gas uh, that forms stars, and then um, how that, that gas is enriching as the stars are forming the heavy elements and blowing up. So implications, okay, first discovery of a complex molecule is in the early universe, um, and um, we restrained ourselves in the amount of puns. Um, one thing about this is just how easy, you know, that as Justin says, it uh, made this result look really easy. Um, this is exactly what JBST was built to do, to understand the early universe, not only to find galaxies in the early universe, but understand them and study them in ways that we've just never had before. So more complicated tools. The other result in Justin's paper is that we used to think that where the dust was, that that's where the new stars would be, and that you could use those, those PA features as a tracer of where the star formation would happen. But in fact, our maps look very different when we look at the dust versus the, ga the hot gas uh, and where the young stars are. So we're seeing a much more complicated picture. Um, where we have smoke, but no fire. We have uh, the, these uh, dust molecules, but there's no new star formation and the other way around. So it's complexifying our view. Uh, we're getting a more nuanced, a more complicated view of how galaxies form their stars. And that's the, the big point here, right? That the, these kinds of, uh, the, the goal of templates and related programs are to understand how galaxies formed their stars. And we have both new results uh, on how those process happened and also new, we're showing, we're demonstrating new tools um, to make those measurements that we've never had before. So this is my summary. Make sure we've hit all of these points. Okay, the new paper is um, from Spilka et al., but I will also elsewhere at this meeting show other results that uh, will be submitted shortly. This is the first discovery of complex organic molecules in the, the early universe at high redshift. Um, and that this is this, these smoke signals are one of several new ways that with our program, with other programs, JWST is able to study galaxies and how they form their stars in a way that we just never could do before. That's it, thank you. We're going to run into the same problem here, and you did have movies, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. So we need to figure this out. <laughs> And for everyone in the room and watching online, I apologize. We will have this figured out by the next press conference this afternoon. So ideally what we want. Release there, yes. So we want to start there. The question is, how do we send this to another? Oh, did you see? Arrangement, yes, thank you. Uh, let's try that. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so I'm going to actually take it back out of presenter mode, I think, then. Or can I just... Yeah. Okay. So that's good. And now in Zoom. <laughs> it keeps, yes, thank you. Giving away your punchline. <laughs> All right, how are we looking? Wonderful. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Patrick Kamineski. I am a postdoctoral fellow at the Arizona State University. Um, today, I'm going to continue the theme of, of this uh, press conference and tell you more about some lensed uh, dusty galaxies, in particular this galaxy, which we've nicknamed El Anzuelo. Um, and I will tell you about uh, what we can learn about the star formation in this galaxy. I am presenting on behalf of the JWST PROS program, which is the prime extragalactic areas for reionization and lensing science, PEROS. Um, and uh, I, will, I will tell you that this work is actually a preview of a sort of broader press release that we're going to be having hopefully later this month. So this is just, just a small preview and uh, keep in mind that there are more results uh, on very connected topics that are coming out very soon. So please keep an eye out for that as well. So the broader results that I'm uh, giving a preview of the other results are uh, also to do with this one galaxy cluster, which is nicknamed El Gordo, or the big one. And it is an ultra massive galaxy cluster that has 10 to the 15 solar masses at redshift, 8 point, uh, redshift 0 0.87. And it's essentially our, uh, the most massive known cluster at its time, which is about 6 billion years after the Big Bang. Uh, so this, this cluster was discovered uh, several years ago, and it has been now followed up with uh, James Webb Space Telescope as part of the PEARLS program. What I'm going to tell you about is this one lens galaxy that is behind the cluster, which, as I said, we've nicknamed El Anzuelo, which is Spanish for the fishhook, and you can probably guess why we've named it that. It's because the background galaxy gets wrapped and distorted in this structure that looks a lot like a fishhook. So to give you sort of a profile of this galaxy, this dusty El Anzuelo galaxy, as I said, gravitational lensing warps and magnifies the background galaxy in the same way that Jane uh, just told us about for the templates program uh, to give us an intimate view of, of star formation in the distant universe. So this galaxy is, is uh, as, as we understand, forming stars 80 times faster than the Milky Way. But in terms of its stellar mass and even its size, it's actually remarkably similar to the Milky Way. It has a mass of about 50 billion suns and uh, a diameter of about six kiloparsecs. But because of lensing, it gets, it gets magnified by a factor of seven in terms of area. And so we can see smaller details that we wouldn't see without lensing. So as I said, this galaxy is at redshift 2.3, which is uh, about 11 billion years in the past or three billion years since the Big Bang. What we want to do when we have these sort of lens galaxies is see what they actually would look like in what we call the source plane or what it would look like if it weren't lensed. And so to do that, we carefully you know, look through the galaxy and identify features that have been multiply imaged by gravitational lensing. Basically the same feature in the background galaxy shows up in multiple places as we observe it. And using that information, we can model the distribution of the foreground mass. And so we can use that model to then apply that to the light that we do see and reconstruct what it looks like in the source plane. So to give you sort of an animation of how that works, this is the galaxy as we observe it. And I'm, I'm sort of undoing the, the distortion from lensing so that we can reconstruct what it looks like in the source plane. So this, this will play a few times 
uh, basically what we're doing here is we're gradually counting more and more for the mass of the foreground and we get this result that looks uh, rather clumpy and, and um, not uniform in the, in the source plane. Uh, and one of the sort of major results that we found is that this galaxy actually shows signs of what we call inside out quenching. Uh, basically by using all of the filters from Hubble and from JWST, uh, 17 different filters, we can sort of reconstruct the shape of the galaxy in all of these filters and see how extended and, and the size of the galaxy. And we can also model the, the distribution of the spectral energy. We can also model the spectral energy distribution of the galaxy. And using those sort of combined pieces of information, we find that there's evidence that there's more concentrated dust in the center of the galaxy, uh, as we find in many other galaxies. But also we find that star formation is suppressed or quenched in the core of the galaxy. And it's actually forming stars more rapidly in the outer regions of the galaxy. And so this is sort of a, a sign that maybe the galaxy is forming and quenching inside out. So basically star formation shuts off sooner in the inside of the galaxy before it eventually uh, quenches in the outer regions. Um, just to sort of demonstrate the power that JWST offers us over Hubble, I'm, I'm sort of crossfading between the previous Hubble image of this galaxy and now what we have with JWST near cam. And you can see the, the immense, you know, the, the number of the, you know, excellent details that we get with JWST because this is a galaxy that is at a higher redshift and it's also very dusty. And so it gets to be very red. And so JWST provides that sensitivity at these redder wavelengths that uh, into, the, into the near infrared that allow us to see all of these great new details. Um, and so this is, this is a galaxy that has been essentially rediscovered with JWST with, with all of this uh, immense new detail. Um, I'll just mention lastly, uh, there is actually a, uh, a video that we've put together at Arizona State University, sort of describing the process of, uh, of, of um, you know, analyzing this galaxy and, uh, and uh, uh, our team, the Pearls team, um, which you're welcome to, to look at if that helps you. Um, and that, that video is available at the link and these slides will be available after as well. Um, yeah, so I'll leave my summary. So as I said, JWST combined with this power of gravitational lensing is revealing new details of how galaxies in the distant universe are assembled. And galaxies like El Anzuelo in particular are forming stars within very dense shrouds of dust that would have been previously previously missed by Hubble. And as I also hinted at, Owensuelo is basically like a dustier version of the Milky Way. It's it's similar in size and in stellar mass, but it seems to be forming stars 80 times faster. And this is 11 billion years in the past that we're looking at this galaxy. Um, so so pretty remarkable. Uh, lastly, as I mentioned, there are four other papers from Diego et al., Fry et al., Carl, Carlton et al., and uh, my paper, Kamineski et al., uh, that go into great detail on this El Gordo cluster. And uh, as I mentioned, there will be a, a broader press release uh, on this uh, cluster coming later this month, hopefully. Uh, but today's just a, a brief preview of, of one part of that. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, all of you here and or online. Uh, so we're going to go ahead now. And assuming I can get us back into gallery view. We're going to go ahead now into our Q&A session. Um, so do we have someone who can run the mic in the room? Yes, okay. Yeah, Harry will bring the mic around to any more questions. <laughs> Hi, Alex Witze, Freelance and Nature Magazine. Sorry for lurking in the back. I wanted Kevin to expand a bit more on the structure that you're seeing in some of these. You sort of flash them up and say, there's structure, look at structure. What kinds of structure are you seeing? What do they look like? How does this form? Just talk a little bit more in detail about the types of complexities you're seeing and what you think that means. Yeah, so in last year's uh, paper, uh, looking at some of the really far away ones above Redshift 10, we found that they were essentially you know, a hundred parsecs of just, so you could imagine kind of like a, a, a nugget of, of stars and gas. Um, the ones we're seeing, you know, at, at Redshift 8, 9, uh, even a little higher up to 11 uh, in, in this data set, 
they're not just individual nuggets. They're they're nuggets that look like they might have you know be in in a string or chains uh, or clumps of nuggets, which you could imagine in the early universe, the ways the galaxies formed was not just one nugget just slowly accumulating, but them coming together to form these early you know galaxies that we now the structure we see in the modern universe. So we're seeing essentially from the first steps to maybe the next sets of steps in terms of how galaxies formed from individual nuggets to clumps that are going to grow together to form much larger galaxies later on in the universe. And Alex just reminded me, could you please identify yourselves yeah. and your affiliation when you ask a question? And same sure. for the folks online, if you're typing in questions, if you could identify yourself and your affiliation, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I'm Justin Robinson, Troy University. My question is for Ryan. The Emission lines that you're using to probe star formation is the classic. It's H beta, it's O3. Those are very good friends of ours for us active galactic nuclei folk. Um, we've seen aging activity in dwarf galaxies in the nearby universe. Can James Webb probe any sort of nuclear activity? Uh, can it? Yes. Okay. Um, do we need more data? Also, yes. <laughs> um, I think we're seeing potential signatures of aging activity in some of the objects in our sample. Um, those results will be discussed in upcoming papers. Um, it also also already been mentioned in the literature. I think that there is some really exciting examples of um, active supermassive black holes that people didn't necessarily expect to exist in these very early epochs of the universe. Um, but you know, it is something we really need to start taking into consideration as we move forward. Great. Thank you very much. We've got a number of questions online. I don't know, Ben, could you read those up? Thank you. Sure. Um, we have one from Ethan Siegel uh, for Kevin. You announced that 42 of your 717 photometrically selected high Z candidates have been spectroscopically confirmed. Mm -hmm. How many galaxy candidates did you take spectra of that were shown to be lower redshift interlopers? So, uh, hi, Ethan. Uh, it turns out in our paper, uh, the answer is none, uh, which is pretty amazing. Uh, Nearspec came back with one object and they said to me, hey, you said this was at redshift nine. Our spectra said this is at redshift one. When we looked back at the object, we found it was two sources right next to each other. <laughs> the Nearspec spectrum was covering one. The object I claimed was at redshift nine was in fact right next to it. And if you do a careful deconvolution of the two galaxies, it's a redshift one or two galaxy next to a redshift nine candidate. And it was a pretty amazing thing. They're going to uh, present that in uh, a paper that's coming out on the archive today that written by Andy Bunker. But uh, that was, you know, some of them are at between redshift of 7.6 and 8, uh, but none of them are below redshift 7.6 from the candidate group that we have. We have one from Monica Young of Sky and Telescope for OR. Uh, one, can you say more about how you were inspired to look at the collapsar cocoons as a source of gravitational waves? And then two, how massive do stars need to be to see these gravitational waves with LIGO? And how often do you expect this to happen in observing run four? Um, okay, so as for the first question, um, so there was the groundbreaking discovery of the multi-messenger binary neutron star merger, GW170817 that showed that the cocoons are playing a major role in the electromagnetic emission. And this motivated many studies to understand better their properties, which as I showed, uh, seem to be uh, um, ideal for gravitational wave emission. Uh, to be honest, I didn't look for cocoons. I uh, was interested in another source of uh, gravitational waves that is around black holes, but just the cocoons were too strong to ignore them. So uh, I had to go and study the cocoons. So this was uh, more or less by chance that um, I started to, to um, try to understand their gravitational wave emission. As for the second question, um, so uh, typically the stars that uh, power this uh, gamma ray burst jets and cocoons are considered to be of a 20 or 30 or 40 solar mass. Um, the exact properties of the star and how they connect with the energy of the cocoon is something that is poorly understood. So what matters for the gravitational wave emission is the cocoon energy, which uh, currently we don't know how it uh, it is linked to the properties of the star. So it's hard to constrain specifically what stars uh, would power the most uh, energetic cocoons. Um, and last, the last question was how often we expect to, uh, to detect them. So in all four, our estimates, and it's highly uncertain because we don't understand fully the properties of the cocoons, we expect something like a 1% chance of a cocoon 
uh, gravitational waves uh, in 04. In 05, it should increase to about 10%. Um, and uh, the most likely scenario is that we will detect those cocoons only in the third generation gravitational wave interferometers. We have one from Camille Carlisle of Sky and Telescope for Kevin and the Jades folks. Uh, what fraction of galaxies at Z greater than eight appear to have stellar disks, uh, i.e. instead of being clumpy messes? Uh, it's still really early on in our exploration of the Jade sources. Uh, when you have uh, 717, it, it, it becomes a, a pretty complicated task to look through all of them very carefully due to that analysis. So that'll be forthcoming is, is ex exactly exploring uh, the, the morphologies and the and, and whether or not they're disks. You know, we, we, we are presenting that, you know, we do see a lot that have more structure than just uh, simple, small, uh, unresolved or, or barely resolved uh, morphology, but we don't have any information about the disk fraction thus far. We are running a little over, but because we lost some time to technical difficulties, if you're all able to stay a little longer, we'll take, continue to take the questions from online and in the room if there are any more. Thank you, Mark. Hi, uh, Mark Zastro, Astronomy Magazine. Uh, and this is for Kevin. Uh, you said that the bursts of star formation that you're seeing in these early galaxies that these bursts and then these interspersed with these quiet periods are very oh sorry ryan my bad uh, you said that they are uh very different from what we see in the local universe uh how so in in amplitude of you know, the amount of the burst or the the rhythm that you see or or what sort of ways so i think the key thing here is that the emission line strengths that we're seeing in the in the very distant universe are far exceeding that this com is really almost ever seen in the present day universe. And what that effectively amounts to is that stars within very early galaxies were forming in these super compact clumps um, and forming, you know, just hundreds and perhaps thousands of these very massive young stars all at once, basically within the span of a couple millions of years. Um, what we normally see in uh, galaxies in the present day is that star formation does occur in, you know, discrete clumps usually, but those clumps are usually far more extended um, and you don't form, you know, such a, a concentrated uh, group of these very hot, massive stars. And what that effectively amounts to is that galaxies in the very early universe were just far more chaotic in general on how they form stars. Um, I hope that answers your question, but if there are any other clarifying remarks, say no. Yep, that's great. Thanks. Online question. Thank you. Uh, this one's from Lisa Grossman of Science News for Ryan. Are those early bright galaxies you mentioned at the end, the ones that appeared too massive to exist at their redshift slash conflicted with the land of Um, I'll answer that question in two parts. So um, first off, uh, no, the, the most massive objects were um, something that was separate from the apparent overabundance of very bright galaxies. So um, with the first thing, it was a couple months of uh, JVC data, there were a handful of papers came out saying that there were far more like Richard greater than 10 galaxies than we had expected from Hubble. Um, and those objects were more often than not pretty bright. Um, and what the results that we're finding at slightly lower redshift, slightly later cosmic times imply is that those very bright galaxies in, you know, at redshift greater than 10 are likely undergoing this burst phase where they are forming a lot of these really hot, massive stars generating just tons of light within them, um, even though they may not actually have that much stellar mass content within them. It's just that the most massive stars are brighter for their given mass than other stars. Um, the remark on the most massive objects that were claimed earlier on, um, I can say that, you know, Again, again, this will be discussed in the upcoming paper, is that we're not really finding evidence of these overmassive objects within our jade sample. Um, the most massive one that I have in my entire sample from Retro 6 to 9 is about 10 to the 10 solar masses. And there were ones claimed early on covering two times the area. 
that you would have 10 to the 11 solar masses, uh, so 10 times more massive. But we're just not finding evidence of that in our data. And I think part of that's just due to the amazing data quality that we have from Jade's that allows us to break down a lot of degeneracies and the different kind of model solutions that you can impose. This is from Camille Carlisle with Sky and Telescope again. Are the early galaxies so dusty because there's so much star formation, or is there something more specific about the kinds of stars being made that is different than star birth today that explains why these galaxies are especially dusty? Well, yeah, so we've never really been able to study dusty galaxies in the distant universe before. This is a new thing that we get to do. So I would say that we don't yet know how similar they are to dusty galaxies at, in the nearby universe. Um, there were indications from Spitzer that they might be very different, but that's a, something to follow up. I would say this is, we're still at the stage of, we're just getting to see this stuff that otherwise was just, we never, you know, it's invisible. And we're now working on, okay, how different is it from nearby, um, uh, from galaxies in the nearby universe? I'll make another comment on that, that um, as part of the Jade special session tomorrow, um, Joris Whitstock is presenting a paper where he shows a, a huge um, amount of carbon in the form of what we usually call the 2100 angstrom bump in nearby galaxies. But seeing this in a galaxy at nearly Z of seven, and that's at a time where it's very difficult to make as much carbon as he's observing. And that's really pressing the question of how does this dust get made? Is it from what we think locally from AGB stars, or is there some mechanism with, with massive star supernovae that we don't understand that's making the dust? So I think we're, we're on the trail of why these galaxies look dusty, but more work to come. So come to the special session tomorrow. <laughs> If I, if I can actually add to that, um, we'll do a team answer for this on the dusty galaxies. Uh, one thing we've seen locally is that um, many of the most star forming galaxies, some of the galaxies that form stars the fastest are preferentially more dusty. I think this is something that we're working to extend into the more distant earlier universe and see if that still holds up, if there is still this correlation between the, the degree to which a galaxy is forming stars and the amount of dust that it has. So I want to be respectful of everybody's time. So let's take one more question from online and then we'll wrap up. Sure, this one's from Bill Waller of the Galactic Inquirer. Um, and I'm going to read it out exactly and I'm not sure all the things it's referring to. So apologies for that. Um, how do you reconcile your SFR versus Z profile with that of the Madau plot? Uh, are your ELGs a small subset of the highest Z galaxies or more characteristic of the genre? So um, the Madau plot that they're referring to, I believe, is the plot that shows that these total amount of stars that are being formed per unit time basically peaks around a redshift of two, so a couple of billion years after the Big Bang. Um, my The results that we're getting from Jade's, collectively, are basically implying that um, you know star formation was far more vigorous or even earlier on in the universe, redshift six to nine or so. Um, first billion years of the Big Bang. What is important for re reconciling those two is that galaxies later, the abundance of galaxies as a whole later on in the universe was far higher than that in the early universe. So even though individual galaxies were more vigorously forming stars in the early universe, the total number of galaxies was far lower in the early universe. And that's how you reconcile the two. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Um, we're gonna go ahead and wrap this up. Thank you so much to all of our speakers, both the ones in the room and or online. Um, really appreciate all of you and your PIOs for preparing releases. I will make sure to get all of the press releases, the briefing slides and the video online today. So if you're looking for materials, those will be up at some point today in the press kit. Um, thank you to USRA, our sponsor. And uh, also thank you to all of you for being here. Very much appreciate it. I hope to see you back again this afternoon where we will have all of the tech issues ironed out, I'm sure, <laughs> at 2.15. Um, and that is gonna be for solar swirls, satellites, and saving the night sky. Thank you.